Hey there, welcome to my newborn YouTube channel, which I hope will become a place for people to come to for content related to architecture. In this first video, I wanna kick it off with a conversation about how architecture is considered both an art and a science. This is me. My name is Stuart Hicks, and I teach architecture and design studios at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I have a small practice with my partner, Allison Newmeyer, called Design With Company. During quarantine, I just f finished up my very first online class where I had to make a lot of videos about architecture for an introductory audience. And by the end, my students convinced me to make a YouTube channel. And so I thought I'd start this channel with the place that I start with that class with thinking about the idea that architecture is both a science art <laughs> and a science, which is something that everyone's kind of heard before, I'm sure. So I would just want to take maybe 10 minutes to talk about it in ways that maybe you hadn't considered it before. When you first hear that phrase, you might think that it means that architecture is something that is both creative and rational, you know, that to sort of problem solve in an architectural space requires you to use like two sides of your brain. That the one side, uh, the science side, would mean that it would be sort of appealing to your, your rational side that it, a building needs to stand up. And in that way, an architect might be understood to be like a scientist or an, an engineer. Another way of thinking about uh, architecture is this sort of art side, which, which one might think of as this uh, creative side, right? That to design buildings requires you to produce something out of nothing and is inherently a creative um, discipline. Another way of thinking about that is that architecture is visual like art is, but buildings also need to accommodate function and various uses. So the science side might be how architects think about how to accommodate human use and program over time versus maybe making it visually and aesthetically pleasing might be appealing to the artistic side. Another way of thinking about it might be this idea of like systematic versus whimsical, like something as being part of a framework at the same time as being something that's like an outlier. To make an analogy that I want to dive into, I want to think about how architecture is like chemistry. Chemistry is, well, technically, chemistry is the study of matter, but I prefer to see it as the study of change now just just think about this i think the way that walter white looks at chemistry is that it's a way of like describing the world it's a way of seeing how the world works and explaining how the world works and chemists deal with chemicals and intervene in the processes that are going on in the world by tweaking and changing chemical formulas and uh, allowing for new chemical processes to take place so chemistry is more than just like the periodic table, like the one behind me, right? Like it's it's more than just, okay, that's a chemical or that's not a chemical. And the same way is like is true for architecture. You know, a lot of people play a game of like, is that architecture? Um, is that building architecture? And I don't think that that's that useful, right? Because it's not that... It's not that that building is and that building isn't in the same way that that's not a chemical and that is a chemical. Architecture is, is something that's kind of happening around us all the time in the same way that chemistry is happening around us all the time. And so some people might look at like a brick wall, like a chemist might look at a brick wall and think about chemistry. They might think about how this wall is being held together with chemical bonds, um, but an architect would look at that wall and think about something very different, looking at it for the way that it would provide enclosure, or they might think about the history of brick walls, you know? So even looking at something as simple as that proves that or shows how um, someone who looks at the world through chemistry might see one thing versus someone who th looks at the world through architecture sees another. And in that sense, I think architecture is like a science. If we think about chemistry as, as a way of looking at the world, I think architecture uh, is also a kind of way of working at the world. And in that way, architecture is like uh, a science. This idea has really been around for really for a long time. So I decided to travel back in time where it's black and white, to ask some uh, important architects to uh, tell me a little bit about how they think about this idea. The first person that I wanted to ask was Le Corbusier, who's probably the most influential architect of the 20th century. I asked him about this idea of uh, whether architecture was uh, an art or a science, or if an architect is like an, an artist or a scientist. And he focused on the idea of architects 
being sort of like engineers or architecture and engineer uh, being related in some way. And that's because he is someone who really values what engineers produce. And he said that the engineer, inspired by the law of economy and governed by mathematical calculation, puts us in accord with universal law. He or she, they, achieve harmony. And then he goes on to say that the architect, by their arrangements of forms, realizes an order which is pure creation of his spirit. By forms and shapes, he affects our senses to an acute degree and provokes plastic emotions. So what I take this to mean is that he's saying that the engineer is able to achieve a certain kind of beauty through through mathematical calculations, and maybe the architect should learn about the forms that the engineer produces, but at the same time, the architect has a kind of command or a capacity to use those forms in a way that engineers wouldn't necessarily know how to do. Le Corbusier really respected engineers, and in books like Towards the New Architecture, he, he writes about how cars and airplanes and ships are some of the most beautiful and profound objects that have been created um, up into that point. He went so far as to start to call buildings machines for living in or houses uh, machines for living in because he wanted to um, put architecture into relationship with the productions of the engineer of some sort. But I also think that architects do something extra or do something different and provide another sort of value to the world. So he's arguing straight up that uh, architects are not scientists or not engineers. So in this imaginary party in the past that in my office here, uh, I, I stopped talking to Cor because I felt like I learned as much as I could. And instead, I asked uh, Hannes Meyer to the party and to ask him about this relationship of art and science to architecture. And he's a good person to ask because Hannes Meyer was the director of a school called the Bauhaus. And the Bauhaus was a school that was dedicated to the arts and to rethinking how the arts sit in our life, the value that they provide our life. And he was also, and Bauhaus is also instrumental in, in rethinking how we make art. And when I asked this question, posed this question to Hannes Meyer, he said that buildings, all things in this world are a product of the formula of function times economy. He said that all things are therefore not works of art. That sounds kind of weird. You're the director of an art school. How are all things not works of art? All art is composition, he says, hence it is unsuited to achieve goals. All life is function and is therefore unartistic. Building is a biological process. Building is not an aesthetic process. So he's arguing that um, if all we think of art as is some sort of aesthetic production, then uh, architecture is not that. It is not an art. So he's arguing on the opposite side. The architecture is not an art because our view of what art is is too limited. Instead, we need to think about art and architecture as something more akin to a biological process. In its new design, he goes on to say, the new dwelling becomes not only a machine for living, so he's kind of quoting or talking to Le Corbusier with that quote, but also, he says, a biological apparatus serving the needs of body and mind. So he's saying that the to design a building is uh, akin to a biological process, which I think is kind of interesting uh, that it's, it's, he's, he's likening it to science. Uh, and by doing that, he's also arguing that architecture is not art because art is limited. After getting everything I could of out of Hannes Meyer in my fictional party uh, of artists and scientists, I went uh, over to the, uh, the appetizer table and started talking to my good friend Paul Feyerobin, who is a uh, scientist philosopher. And so he's really um, keen on thinking about the role of science in our lives. And he went on this diatribe about how um, science maybe isn't quite as systematic and ordered as we would initially think it is. And he started to say that progress is a has always been achieved by probing well-entrenched and well-founded forms of life with unpopular and unfounded values. This is how man gradually freed himself from fear and from the tyranny of unexamined systems. In order to free ourselves from the shackles of thinking we know everything, we need to question what we think we know and test it all of the time. He goes on to say that knowledge is not a gradual approach to truth, it is an ever-increasing ocean of mutually incompatible alternatives. Nothing is ever settled. The task of the scientist should be to make the weaker case the stronger. So things, holding two things in our mind or in our space that can't both be true, 
And I think that's a great way of describing architecture too, as well as this idea that architecture is both an art and a science. These are two things that um, complement one another. They might be at odds at w with one another at any given time, but it's important that we hold them both. So I left the party and uh, I wanted to think a little bit more about how this idea of questioning established more norms might also be true about science and then also and then be true about art as well. And so I want to take, for instance, the, the, the artist Jackson Pollock. For years, you know, people had been dripping paint onto their paintings. And that was just seen as as bad form, right? Like you are just not a good painter if you're uh, if you allow paint to drip onto your painting. But culturally, at the time when when Jackson Pollock was painting, there were shifts around the conversation of art. And these shifts were to try to get at what the essence of art was all about. And at the time, people were thinking about, well, maybe art and let's say painting shouldn't be about how much a painting is able to represent the world or like how well an artist is able to make a painting of a tree look like a tree. Instead, maybe the essence of painting has to do with the quality of the paint on the canvas. So the actual materials and the stuff that uh, makes up the the painting and Jackson Pollock's work of dripped paint on canvas represents a pretty big shift uh, in this regard because the the paint itself and the qualities of the paint like the physical material dripping and that 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 sort of viscousness of the paint is able to be transferred into um, the the final result of the painting if we look at a diagram of artists of the early 20th century we can start to see a kind of uh, abstract relationship between the different kinds of art happening at, at the time. And this is a complicated diagram, but the diagram reveals a global conversation between artists. Sometimes this is literally a conversation, as in two people talking to one another. Other times it might just be um, two people's work looking similar or dealing with similar issues and the result of some something in the air at a time. Either way, this is uh, this di complicated diagram represents what I would want to call the, a discourse uh, of art. And this discourse is this conversation of things that people are concerned about, things that people think that art can do at any given time. And this kind of diagram also, I think, starts to get at the idea that we could start to classify art uh, in the same way that we might start to think about scientific classification. So this almost looks like a species tree or something like that. So what we might think of um, in science as a really intrinsic and important um, thing, the idea of categorizing something, uh, is also true for art. And in this schema, for something to be considered important art, it needs to contribute to the conversation that it's a part of at any given time. So the art is not necessarily just the, the sort of whimsical creative energy of some lone individual. Instead, it's about um, a global conversation. And this is a diagram of architecture in the 20th century that's kind of similar to the one that I showed for art. And it works in a pretty similar way and tries to create a matrix or a, a kind of connectivity diagram between different people and styles and things like that, working at an array of different times. So architecture is valued not just for how well it provides shelter or how aesthetically pleasing it is, but instead how it advances this, this discourse. So I would argue that architecture operates like a science in a few ways that are beyond the ways that it uh, architects need to be engineer-like in certain times to create buildings that stand up or get build buildings built at all. Because according to Paul Feyerabend, uh, science is about questioning norms or questioning what we think we know. And I think that architecture too is about questioning what we know. And architecture is definitely about p providing mutually incompatible alternatives, just the act of um, imagining new worlds or imagining what could be there instead of what actually is there, I think it has to do with this mutual, this ocean of mutually inc incompatible alternatives. And architecture is also like an art um, beyond the idea that architects need to be creative um, because architects and architecture is evaluated in, in, uh, in relationship to a kind of global discourse about the role of the built environment uh, at any given time. Since this is my first video, I haven't developed a catchphrase or a way to close off yet. I know everyone says, give me a like and subscribe, so I'll uh, say it by quoting others. 
<laughs> to include it there. But if you do like this kind of content, if you um, think you might like other videos about um, sort of fundamental concepts about architecture and looking at them maybe in alternative ways, then I'd like to hear about it. And um, I'll create a, I'll try to create a suite of videos that maybe sometimes come from the course that I teach, maybe hitting some of those um, important points, but then expand uh, well beyond that with other kinds of content. Even if you don't like it, you can tell me that too. But I also wanna thank my uh, students for encouraging me to make some videos. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks. Oh, 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 oh,